One of my big sewing projects for this year is to make an 1840s evening dress to go to the Prior Attire Ball in Bath. And I've been wanting to do more historical projects for a while now, and as we all know, the first step in creating the historically appropriate silhouette is the appropriate undergarments, which for this era would start with a chemise. Now a chemise is a relatively straightforward garment, and I've made lots of them before, and yet for some reason I just haven't been able to get started on this project. But that all ends today. Let's get to it. So I've been trying to figure out why I struggled to get started on this project, and then I realised I'd been influenced. I'm sure you, like me, watch a lot of historical sewing content online. There are so many incredible creators out there making amazing historical recreations and doing incredible research, but actually what's happened is the standard for what is really a very beginner-friendly basic garment has gotten so high. And when you do share your work online, there is this sort of continued pressure to justify your audience's attention. And I had convinced myself that unless my chemise was drafted from a historical pattern and hand sewn using appropriate linen thread, then it wasn't good enough. And of course, that's bollocks. And I'm sure all the creators I also watch would probably agree with that. The reality is, I just don't care. You know, it's a chemise. Nobody's gonna see it. I'm really not interested in sewing it. For me, the chemise is a means to an end to get to the pretty dress. And I, as a disabled person, just simply don't have the time and the energy to waste sewing things I'm not excited about. So I gave myself permission to let go. We are making a shitty chemise and that's okay. So what I did was I went online and I bought one of these Simplicity patterns. This is Simplicity 1139. In the online listing, it said Civil War undergarments. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure when that is. I mean, I know roughly. But the reason I was drawn to this one was that it was sort of generic enough that it could do most of the 19th century. And my logic there is I'd like to avoid ever having to do this whole process again. So I want a garment that's going to be as multi-purpose as possible. I'm not making the corset but I will probably make the bloomers as well and I know I have enough various weights of cotton in my stash that I don't need to buy any fabric for this. I have plenty of white thread thanks to my overlocker so I say we get started. My first challenge with this pattern was the cutting layout. The front and back pieces are just this big rectangle but whereas the Victorians would have used the width of the fabric my fabric was so wide that there wasn't a way to avoid this awkward rectangle along the edge of the fabric. It would just about fit the side panels on, but all the other pieces were too wide to get out of this part. In the end, I decided to just go for it and deal with the wasted fabric later. I'm not using any pins or even weights here. It's a rectangle. It'll be fine. To try and make the most out of the fabric, I put the straight edge of the side piece right up against the cut edge of the square back piece. This not only saves fabric, but it also cuts down the number of long straight edges I have to cut. I then flip the pattern piece so that it'll fit along the selvage, so that's one less raw edge to worry about. Now I watch this back, I wish I had just made the gourd slightly wider so that I didn't waste this long diagonal strip between them. That certainly would have been a more historically accurate way to do it, but hey, I'd committed to following the pattern, so I guess I just ignored all logic and trusted simplicity. With the big pieces cut, I sat down to cut out the rest as efficiently as I could from that wasted fabric along the edge of the big rectangle. I did at this point finally start using pins. I felt accuracy was probably a bit more important for the smaller pieces. Here I'm cutting out the underarm facings. At this point I really wasn't even sure what this piece was for, but we'll come back to these because, well, it was a journey. I ended up ignoring the straight of grain markings for the yoke pieces and cutting them on the cross grain at a 90 degree angle. I just couldn't bring myself to waste all that fabric and meh, it'll be fine. I could barely fit the front yoke pieces on the last bit of this scrap, but it just about fit. Now something I normally do, which I completely skipped for this project, was to transfer all the notches, sewing lines, small circles. I didn't put a single mark on these fabric pieces. Instead I just measured things and used pins to mark them as I went along. So here I'm working on the front vent, which has a narrow hem all the way around. Only I didn't actually read the instructions before I cut into the fabric pattern piece, which turned out to be a bad idea because I had already made a mistake. Literally the first instruction and I'd done it wrong. In my defense, I got my half and quarter inch markings confused on my tape measure, which is another of the reasons I hate imperial measurements. But anyway, after finally reading the instructions, I creased back the fabric along that cut edge at half an inch. Only it wasn't supposed to be a half inch, it was supposed to be a quarter. 
I then unfolded that fold and brought the raw edge in to meet that crease, creating another fold at a quarter inch. Then folded that in again along that crease I just made to create a double fold hem. Then of course, repeat for the other side. I then realized I put the pins in the wrong direction. It would be much easier to sew it if they were pointing the other way around, so I changed them. As I didn't add any markings, I had to keep consulting the paper pattern pieces to figure out how this pleat was supposed to work. And then I realized, I think my opening is bigger than theirs. Whoops, yes it is. Oh well, we'll just have to make a bigger pleat, won't we? I spent a little while puzzling over how I was going to make this work and would it affect any of the other steps I would have to do later. After a while, I realized it would just mean that the front would be a bit less gathered than the back, so I just went with it. Eventually, after rereading the instructions about three times, I was able to make sense of it all, so I stitched the hems on the edge of the opening in place. Basically, what went wrong was I made the hems too wide so that the rectangular opening was too wide, which meant I had to make a much bigger pleat to get the edges to overlap. I then stitched the pleat in place along the bottom of the opening, making sure that the little triangle of fabric was folded down inside the pleat. To reinforce the opening and to make sure that little triangle was secure and wouldn't fray out, I stitched a box with an X in it, like you often see on plackets. This wasn't in the instructions, it was just a little bit of extra reinforcement because I knew I was going to be throwing this garment in the washing machine. With the pleat in place at the centre front, I could add the neck gussets, which were these little triangle pieces. Then it was on to the side gore pieces, which I didn't even pin in place, I just measured down from the top to see where to start the side panel and machined in place, smoothing as I went. The four side panels were first stitched to the main body pieces, two on the front, two on the back. Then the front and back pieces were joined, but only along the straight edge of the side gores. The rest of the seam, the bit without the gores, was left open. And then I decided I'd done enough for one day. I'd actually gotten a lot done for me, and you can probably tell it was getting dark, so I called it a night. So, day two. I got quite far yesterday. We have a tube with some gussets and a uh, vent opening in the front. The next step, in the instructions it calls for flat felt seams, and I did consider doing that because I've never done that before and I thought, oh, that would be great to show my audience. But this cotton lawn, it's very fiddly. Don't have time for that, can't be bothered. So I'm gonna get the overlocker out and overlock everything. So how many more steps have I got after that? Oh, then I'm onto the sleeves, which are weird. I've never seen a sleeve constructed like this before with this underarm guard. I have no idea what's going on there. And then the yoke, which is a few more steps. So I'd say we're about a third of the way through the instructions. Hopefully it will be a little quicker for me because they have some applied lace detailing on the yoke and the sleeves. I'm not gonna bother with that. Nobody's gonna see it. So it's not the best day today. It's really cold. Uh, I got lipstick on my puffer jacket thing. So I'm just feeling a bit cack-handed today, basically. So let's hope everything goes all right. <laughs> Hang on, I have to double check which bits get enclosed. I had to be really careful when overlocking the seam allowances that I didn't catch anything under the needle and the blade that I wasn't supposed to. There was also a weird moment where the side panel started, so I decided to just overlock the two layers of seam allowance together. This made things a bit trickier later, but it was fast and secure. I basically just didn't want to ever have to do this again, so I went for strength and durability. So for the first time on this project, I'm getting my iron out. <laughs> so I'm just going to give everything I've done a bit of a press. You can see here, I've got some grubby thread from my sewing machine not doing what it was supposed to. Right, let's press these into place. Let's press the overlocking, hopefully get some of that crinkling out. Crack out the sleeve board. I think let's push these towards the gusset. You can see this lawn's very sheer. Whoops, maybe not ideal. The reveal for this might be interesting. So, with right sides together, pin underarm gusset to one side edge of sleeve. It actually took me a little while to make sense of how this all went together because one side of the gusset had this angled off corner and of course I hadn't transferred all the markings. 
It was easy to get these white squares and rectangles confused. Once I eventually figured out which way up everything was supposed to go, I pinned the gusset to the sleeve and then realized that the next step would be to sew gathering stitches into the sleeve, which would be much easier if the gusset wasn't flapping about all over the place. So I took the pins out again and turned my stitch length up to sew two rows of gathering stitches along the bottom of the sleeves. Then I pinned the gussets back in place and machined them between the small circles. These small circles on commercial patterns are often to mark the junction at the sewing line between two pattern pieces. So they're a seam allowance width in from the edge, which makes them pretty easy to estimate using the markings on my stitch plate. Then the other edge of the gusset has to be joined to the other edge of the sleeve. I flipped the sleeve around so that I started sewing from the point where I finished sewing the other side of the gusset. This meant that I can really precisely start the stitching exactly where I finished the other line of stitching, making sure that all my seam allowances are flat and nothing is caught where it shouldn't be. Again, I finished sewing at the small circle, which is just a centimeter and a half in from the edge. I then seam the sleeve cuffs into a tube, matching right sides together and reversing at each end. You can see this red thread through the selvage here, which as it turns out is still visible through the fabric of the cuff. Part of me really wishes I'd taken it out, but I didn't, so I'll have to live with it. Then I crease those seams open with my fingers before pressing them in place using my sleeve board. Then I measured and pressed the seam allowance to the wrong side. This is something commercial patterns have you do to make finishing the inside easier, but after doing it for this project, I don't think it's any easier or quicker. I then realized I'd missed a step when installing the gussets and needed to seam up the bottom section of the sleeves. Again, I very carefully started stitching exactly where I had stopped at the bottom of the gusset. I then pulled on the gathering threads to shrink the sleeve down to the same size as the cuff and pinned the edge of the cuff I hadn't pressed under earlier to the sleeve with right sides together. I then took a break from the sleeves to prep all the remaining pieces that needed to be joined together. The yoke pieces and then those mysterious underarm guards. Then taking the tray table off my machine, I stitched the cuffs onto the gathered bottom of the sleeves, taking my time to make sure the gathers all lay nicely. With the cuffs now stitched on and holding the gathers in place, I could remove the gathering threads before pressing the cuffs into position. First I pressed the cuff down away from the sleeve, setting the gathers in place, and then I began folding the cuff into position on the wrong side, matching up that pressed under edge with my line of stitching, so that the folded edge was just past the stitching by a millimetre or so, making it easier to stitch in place later. And well, you know me, always batching my tasks, so while I had the iron out, I pressed the seams open on the yoke pieces I had joined together earlier, which was when I noticed this mysterious blue gunk right in the middle of the back piece. Oh well, it's at the back. I then also pressed open the seams on the mysterious underarm guards before getting out my wool pressing mat to press the seam allowances under easier. How much am I pressing it under? Quarter inch. Fiddling about with those tiny seam allowances was incredibly annoying, particularly around the curved edges at the bottom. If I'd been able to use steam on my iron, I might have been able to shrink some of the excess out, but the steam function has stopped working on my iron, and of course, I could have clipped the excess out, but with so little seam allowance, that would make it vulnerable to fraying, so I decided to just struggle. I also pressed under the much more reasonable centimetre and a half seam allowances along the bottom of the facing pieces. Although it was here where I really wish I could have chalked on the seam allowances as this would have been much easier to do with an actual line to follow. Before I could attach the sleeves, I had to neaten the seam allowances of the gussets with flat felt seams. To make a flat felt seam, you trim down one half of the seam allowance and then fold the other half over it, pinning it to the fabric of the garment to keep everything flat and enclosed. As I had suspected, this was very fiddly on this lightweight lawn, and I had to fuss with the bottom of the triangle where the gusset comes to a point with the sleeve seam to make it sit flat and not catch the sleeve at a funny angle. With everything pinned, I could start top stitching the flat felt seams in place. You can of course do this by hand, but I didn't have time for that and I decided against using my top stitching foot, as I find on lightweight fabrics it can push the edge I'm following out of line. 
I then machined the cuffs to enclose the bottom of the sleeves. In the end, I just top stitched the cuff rather than try and do a sink stitch or stitch in the ditch. Again, my goal was speed and durability here and this method was the strongest and most likely to work first time. I then prepped the yoke, joining the two pieces along the top curved edge with right sides together. Then it was time to insert the sleeves. Now, what was so strange about the sleeve construction is there's no yoke portion of the chemise yet, so you're only attaching the bottom half of the sleeve. The armhole is also rectangular, so you have to do the short bottom edge first, which is the top of the side gauze, and then attach the rest, starting at the neck gussets and machining down to create a corner with the line of stitching you've already sewn. With all the seams from all the gussets, this was tricky and I didn't get it right the first time. I caught up all the seam allowances where I wasn't supposed to, so I had to try again. Well, I have gotten quite a lot done today. I mean, it's starting to look like a chemise, isn't it? And I've got the sleeves in and done all of that. The only thing I'm up to next is these underarm facings. To my surprise, this pattern it has some historical accuracies, particularly in terms of the cut. So they must have included this underarm facing for some historical logic. However, they have you construct it in a modern way where it doesn't make any sense. Do you know what I mean? What what the Victorians probably would have done is just turned under the ed both edges, pinned it on and whipped it in place by hand. But because it's a simplicity pattern, what they're having you do is like completely try and bag it out and you have to clip the corners and like flip everything and it's a bit convoluted and weird and I just don't I mean it's getting dark it's five o'clock you know I've kind of just had enough for today so I think I'm gonna leave that for tomorrow but yeah all in all good progress I'd say welcome back day three now and it's time to face these underarm facing things I've got my tea so I don't know if I'm able to even explain to you how this works. I think I'll just have to show you. So let's get right to it. What I don't understand is if I am sewing through just the seam allowance or whether I'm sewing through all the layers, including the fabric of the gusset like that. I think it must be all the layers. <laughs> this is so complicated. Nope, I'm doing this wrong. Oh my God. And then I flip that down. But then what's the point of that? Oh my God, this doesn't make any sense. What am I even supposed to be doing? But then they've got the, oh my God, simplicity. What is the matter with you? So when something like this happens and I can't make sense of what the hell is going on, I always find it's most useful to reverse engineer it. So to start with how I want it to look when it's finished, which in this case is this over this like that or at least I think that's what they're going for. And then this this is somehow top stitched on here. It doesn't really seem necessary to me to have this facing. I could surely just fold under and fell it. What's the benefit of having this facing? Oh, I suppose it's to cover up this bit as well, isn't it? Okay, there is a logic. But even so, let's just top stitch it on. I'm not faffing about with that. going to put in a few reverse stitches before I pivot around to really reinforce this point where I've cut the fabric because the likelihood is it'll fray like I said I'm really not I'm really not bothered about this <laughs> I really do not care what it looks like for the other sleeve I did make an attempt at the method the pattern suggested but I don't think it was any quicker or neater in the end so you know I was like, I really do not care, I'm just going to whack it on, it'll be fine. Um, yeah, I'm going to unpick this half because it's just not sitting properly. I've missed some of it here, I haven't caught it down. This is just annoying me. I was pressing it and I was like, mm, can I iron out all those wrinkles? Turns out no, I can't. So yeah, I think I'm going to unpick this section and do it again. But this side, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's, it's acceptable. <laughs> With the underarm guards finally on, I used a long stitch to run gathering stitches along the top edge of the body and sleeves of the chemise in one line, including over the triangular neck gussets. The underarm guards ended up longer than the gussets, so I just trimmed them down to match. 
I realized too late that it would have been much easier to sew the gathering stitches in stages to match up the chemise to the yoke better, but I forgot about it, so oh well. I then notched the curve of the yoke seam, ready to turn it right sides out. I don't like to clip the corners of waistbands and pieces like this yoke because they're so lightly to fray, so instead I very carefully folded my seam allowances and turned the point of the yoke piece over the seam allowance to get a crisp edge. I then started finger pressing along the seam to make it easier to iron in place. I used this method all along the yoke to get the seam right along the edge. I then pulled on the gathering threads to fit the chemise into the edge of the yoke. Because I didn't have any markings and I'd made the pleat at the front too big, I just had to guess how to distribute the volume, but it worked out okay. I then machined the yoke onto the chemise, being careful to stroke the gathers into place as I went. I could then press the yoke round to the wrong side and then into position, enclosing the raw edges and matching that folded edge up to my stitching line so I could top stitch it in place. This was tricky at times because of the curved shape of the yoke, it wanted to stretch on the bias. I didn't do a brilliant job of keeping it smooth, but it is at least secure. I also top stitched around the top edge of the yoke. This was sort of decorative, but I was also worried about this slippery cotton lawn distorting once the chemise was on, so it was also for strength and structure. The majority of the construction was now complete, so I started on the hem, turning and pressing it up once, and then a second time, and pinning it into place. I machined the hem in place, there's already so much top stitching on this thing, I didn't see the point of starting hand sewing now. See this here? This is where my bobbin ran out on the hem. I was so nearly done. <sighs> then all I needed was a closure at the centre front. They suggested buttons and loops, and that seemed sensible enough to me, so I found some appropriate buttons in my stash. I have some nice vintage lingerie buttons, but as this is my shitty chemise, I didn't really want to use them here. Instead, I settled on these plastic pearl effect ones. I stitched the buttons on, making sure the placket was going to overlap nicely, and then started work on the thread loops. I had originally wanted to use a thicker embroidery floss, but I didn't have a true white, so I used just ordinary sewing thread. With hindsight, I think this was a mistake and I'd change this in the future, because it didn't want to stay shut when worn. But with those hand stitches, it meant the chemise was finally done. So it's all finished and I went to try it on for the final reveal. It's much too big. So what I did was I got a willing volunteer, aka my mum, <laughs> to pin a pleat in the back because it's like an off the shoulder design. I cut this piece, the yoke piece, to be the size I would normally make, which is a 12 for a commercial pattern like this, forgetting that I often make shoulder adjustments to things because I've got narrower shoulders than average, I guess. And um, yeah, it just slips right off the shoulder, which I don't think it's supposed to do. You see on the ladies here, it really sits on the roll of the shoulder and mine was sitting like here off the shoulder, completely straight across the top of the bust. And I don't think I want that. So I think I'll make it a box pleat. I'll sew along there and then I'll iron it like that that it's centered and then maybe just machine it in place at the top as well. I think that'll do. And you know, when I said I was gonna press it, I'm not even gonna bother with that. <laughs> just gonna finger press it. I need a pin there, I think. Ta-da, it's done. I don't really know what to say in terms of conclusion for this video. Normally, I like to include a few little critiques, pros and cons, that sort of thing. But my overwhelming feeling with this project is, yeah, it's done. I think in the wider context of my sewing practice, this project was good for me. 
It reminded me that sewing isn't always about the process or an artistic expression. Sometimes you just need something quickly and cheaply and sewing is the best way to get it. And now I have a chemise. I have a few more undergarments to make before I can get started on the ball gown, but I've finally gotten started. Thanks for watching. See you next time.